good to start sir yes hello everyone a warm welcome to you we are now going to discuss the neurosurgery recall questions that was asked in the recently concluded neat ss 2025 exam so we had roughly about six questions which have been asked uh, from neurosurgery so we'll discuss about them one by one so the first question was about cerebral microdialysis what what is false regarding cerebral microdialysis option a is it invasive option b it is a biochemical test that is based on the diffusion principle option c can be used to study the effects of drugs on metabolism on brain metabolism option d it is used as a routine tool in icu monitoring now what is false is it is not a routine tool in icu monitoring why because it is an invasive technique that is used in neurocritical care so what we do in microdialysis is that we do a continuous monitoring of the cerebral metabolism in patients with severe brain injury or with very poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage following an aneurysmal sah and they are used in characterizing the level of neuroinflammation to assess potential neuroprotective drugs and direct intraparenchymal substrate delivery through retro microdialysis or retro dialysis so how do we do it it is basically a catheter and that catheter can be inserted into the patient's brain during the craniotomy or even through a single bar hole that can be done so it can be used the microdialysis monitor can be used along with other monitors also like a brain tissue oxygen tension or the icp monitor or even the intraparenchymal temperature monitoring so all these other monitors also can be inserted along with that electrode so here the extracellular chemistry of the patient's brain is being monitored and we are attempting to tailor the treatment to the patient's cerebral metabolism to his own brain metabolism the most important thing is monitoring the brain glucose level why because both extremely high and low level and low levels of the glucose in the brain can lead to worse outcome and we need to know the critical neuroglycopenia that can be detected at the earliest and infusion with the glucose or loosening of the glycemic control is very important why because you know the brain depends only on glucose for its metabolism so when there is a derangement in the glucose level when especially when there is a low glucose level as in the neuroglycopenia it can result in a very it can add insult to the already existing injury so we do not want that to happen and similarly the low cerebral glucose along after sah may herald an impending delayed cerebral ischemia together with elevated lactate pyruvate ratio and glutamate levels so this we can monitor and we can intervene at a right time to have give a good outcome for the patient and the second question was an image based question where they gave this image and they asked the possible diagnosis option a bessler invagination option b platybasia or is it option c carry malformation or is it d renal settling so what has happened here is if you can see here the this is the c2 this is actually the c2 this is c2 this is c3 so normally the shape of the odontoid process will be like this so here if you can see if you can appreciate the odontoid process has curved in like this you can appreciate that the odontoid process has curved in like this so it is going there and impinging on the medulla so that is what has happened so this is a characteristic case of bessler invagination this is a characteristic case of bessler invagination so what is this bessler invagination so we will we'll discuss about all these terms now bessler invagination like i told you is nothing but the tip of the odontoid process it pro projects above the foramen magnum and it is going to compress into the craniovertebral junction that is the brain stem and the upper part of the cervical cord when they get compressed so it is frequently associated with platybasia so what is this platybasia the platybasia is nothing but the flattening of the skull base i'll draw you the skull base this is how actually the skull base is this is your clivus this is the base occiput this will be the c2 this will be the anterior and posterior arches of c1 and this will be the 
posterior process of C2, spinous process of C2. So this will be the C1 anterior arch. This, this, this is the anterior arch of C1. This is the posterior arch of C1. Okay. And this will be our odontoid process. This entire thing is going to be the odontoid process. And this will be the C2's spinous process. So this structure here, this is going to be the clivus. This is the clivus. So this is what is the foramen magnum. This is what is the foramen magnum. So what happens in platybasia is this clivus is not like this. This clivus becomes something like this. It becomes more obtuse. It becomes more obtuse. And frequently there will be a basilar invagination. Frequently there will be a basilar invagination. So the entire shape of the skull will be like this. So there will be too much of compression happening here. There will be too much of compression happening here. Whereas here you have an enough space. The natural curvature will be maintained. So this is what is platypasia. So basically the flattening of the skull base, that is what you call it as platypasia. And what eventually it does is there is stenosis of the foramen magnum, compression on the middle oblongata resulting in neurological symptoms, obstructive hydrocephalus, syringomyelia and even death due to a raised ICT, due to a raised ICT. So all this can happen in patients with basilar invagination. So commonly associated with Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, clipple fail syndrome. So how do they present? They present with chronic headaches, limited neck mobility or even with acute neurological deterioration. So we need to know about these four terminologies, basilar invagination, basilar impression, cranial settling and platybasia. So basilar invagination, I already told you, it is nothing but the upward displacement of the vertebral elements. That is the C2, that is the odontoid process into the normal foramen magnum. So that is what is basilar invagination. That is the C2 going into the craniovertebral junction is basilar invagination. The same thing. If it happens due to an acquired bone softening problem, like rickets, osteomalacia, that is what is called as basilar impression. So vitamin D deficiency, rickets, so all this, when it is congenital, it is invagination. If it is acquired, it becomes basilar impression. So basically the same thing, but if it were to be congenital, you call it as invagination. If it happens due to an acquired cause, like even a renal failure, <coughs> you call it as basilar impression. So what is this cranial settling? Cranial settling is nothing but a specific term for the same pathology if it happens in rheumatoid arthritis where some exudates go and get settled above the tip of the odontoid. That is what you call it as cranial settling. And then we have something which is called as platybasia. Like I already told you, it is nothing but the skull base flattening. That is the already obtuse angle is becoming more obtuse. That is the clivus becomes more obtuse. That is what you call it as skull base flattening or platybasia. Okay. So the next one was a very straightforward question, which asked about the dimension to call as pituitary macroadenoma. Is it more than 10 millimeters, less than 10 millimeters, more than 15 millimeters, less than 15 millimeters? You know, the answer is going to be more than 10 millimeters. So anything, any pituitary lesion, if it is more than one centimeter, you call it as pituitary macroadenoma and you call it as a giant macroadenoma when the size of the lesion is more than 25 millimeters or 2.5 centimeters. So that is the cutoff to call it as a pituitary macroadenoma and giant macroadenoma. Okay. The next was a very interesting question which went on about brown sequat syndrome is due to. Is it option A, intradural extramedullary tumor? Option B, intramedullary tumor? Option C, extra dural compression or is it due to option D, syringomyelia. So what is this intramedullary, intradural extramedullary? It is within the dura, but it is outside the spinal cord. That is, for example, it could be a meningioma or it could be a schwannoma. Intramedullary tumor means it happens within the substance of the spinal cord, which is nothing but an astrocytoma or even an ependymoma. Extra dural compression happens because of vertebral body collapse, because of vertebral body collapse or hemangiomas or because of bony tumors like an osteoid osteoma, those sort of stuff will cause the extra dural compression. And then you have the syringomyelia. Syringomyelia is nothing but a cystic en en enlargement of the spinal cord. Within the substance of the spinal cord, you have the central canal that is which contains the CSF. 
sometimes it can gets enlarged that is what you call it as syringomyelia or even hydromyelia syringomyelia is there is more cs of collection happening within the substance of the spinal cord so brown sequet syndrome so brown sequet syndrome happens due to intradural extramyelitis i'll explain to you why so first of all what is this brown sequet syndrome to understand this better it is better that we draw and learn so this is the posterior part this is the anterior part okay this is the anterior part so now i am going to draw you the cross section of the spinal cord okay so so this is how the spinal cord is going to look like on the outer aspect so this will be within the substance of the spinal cord so this is the central column this here is the central column so this is this will be your posterior column this is your posterior column which is responsible for the fine touch proprioception joint position sense and uh, vibration sense this will be carried by the posterior column and here ventrally you will have the spinothalamic tract this will be the spinothalamic tract so this tract is responsible for temperature and pain sensation for the opposite side for the contralateral side and similarly here just posterior to the equator just posterior to the central canal you will have the cortico spinal tract okay this is the cortico spinal tract which is responsible for the movement on the same side this this happens because the decompensation has already happened whereas for spinothalamic tract alone it will travel two levels above and then cross over to the opposite side okay it will travel two levels above and then cross over to the opposite side that is why in spinothalamic tract alone it will be contralateral whereas the other two it will be ipsilateral so what happens here is in hemi section of spinal cord one side of the spinal cord is completely compressed one side of the spinal cord has lost its function so meaning there will be ipsilateral glass of posterior column and ipsilateral cortico spinal tract whereas the the sensory findings alone will be on the opposite that is the spinothalamic tract sensations alone will be on the opposite side so it will result in weakness and paralysis and loss of proprioception proprioception and vibration sense on the same side of the damage whereas the temperature and pain loss alone will be on the opposite side so why is it happening it, is, it could happen because of a tumor an extra dural tumor that is going to compress on this part of the spinal cord okay so that is why the brown sequet syndrome happens why not an intramedullary tumor an intramedullary tumor is a tumor that arises within the substance of the spinal cord so it is going to be something like this <coughs> it is going to be something like this so that is why an intramedullary tumor is less likely to present with a brown sequence a vertebral collapse is going to compress the entire spinal cord so it will result in more like a complete paralysis rather than a incomplete one so examples for this brown sequence syndrome will be gunshot wounds stab injuries motor vehicle accidents blunt trauma fractured vertebra from a fall or even falling disc herniations cysts cervical spondylosis tumors or multiple sclerosis so blood brain barrier regarding present in was the next question so the answers were option a is it from the choroid plexus of the third ventricle floor of the fourth ventricle neurohypophysis and anterior pituitary i believe this question was not properly framed because what we here what we are dealing with here is regarding the sarcomenticular organs the answer will be anterior pituitary why because sarcomenticular organs are nothing but small size structures lining the cavity of the third ventricle uh like the neurohypophysis ovlt or the organ of vasculosum lamina terminalis subfornical organ pineal gland and the subcommissural organ or even the area postrema all these are sarcomenticular organs so the only exception was the anterior uh, the adrenal hypophysis so that should be the answer so based on eliminating the other things i have taken that as the answer this is a very important question
these structures are devoid of blood brain barrier so that is why it is very important what is false regarding the diagnosis was the last question that we are going to discuss this image was given first you need to know what this is probably an image like this was given so this is actually a cutaneous marker this is seen in type 1 spinal dystrophism is seen in type 2 spinal dystrophism patient has occult spinal dystrophism or is it fawn style that was given in the image so this is actually fawn style that has been given in the image okay fawn style is nothing but hypertrichosis happening along the back i'll explain to you the question later i'll first describe what it is fawn st fawn style is nothing but a congenital localized hypertrichosis which is an occult marker which is a marker for occult spinal dysrhythm it commonly happens in the lumbosacral area so there are two types type 1 and type 2 in type 1 the, the, what happens is the spinal cord is split into two halves that is why it is called as split cord malformation the two halves diastomatomyelia meaning dia is two there is a stem that separates the spinal cord into two halves so what is that stem if that stem were to be a board it is type 1 if it were to be a fibrous septum it is type 2 very simple so if it were to be a bone that separates the spinal cord into two elements that is going to be type 1 split cord malformation if it were to be a fibrous septum it is type 2 and what are all the other cutaneous markers that you have to know they are abnormal hair growth that is the hypertrichosis that we have shown here or even cutaneous hemangiomas elangiectasias hyperpigmentation subcutaneous lipoma dermal sinus tract all these are cutaneous markers in patients with occult spinal dysfunction so this image here was actually a fawn style and it is a marker for occult spinal dysfunction and the only thing is it is commonly associated with type 1 spinal dysfunction so that will be the answer so with that the discussion on the neat ss questions is done i believe this was uh, useful for you i'm very sorry for the cough that i had towards the end of the session i have um, and i believe the session was useful to you thank you <coughs> Thank you sir. I'm uh, very sorry I had a bad cough towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>